left Republican leaders, quote, shell-shocked today by agreeing with congressional Democrats on a deal to fund disaster relief, avoid a government shutdown, and raise the debt limit. Let's bring in our political specialists. And Dan, I want you and our viewers to take a look at this photo, a photo of President Trump and Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader, the minority leader, uh, in the Oval Office. Uh, look at that picture. They, uh, they seem to be ch uh, you know, best friends in that picture, but Republicans were reportedly stunned by the president's sudden alliance with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. Uh, what happened in the Oval Office? What happened is that the president completely surprised everybody, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, by effectively ignoring the, the pleas from Republicans to go, Republican leaders in Congress, to go along with what they thought was a plan to push for an extension, first of all, of, of, at the most, uh, at, excuse me, at the very least, 18 months for the debt limit, uh, because they thought tactically and then just policy and politically, all of the, for all those reasons, that they would want to kind of kick it down past the next election. Well, the president not only said no to that, I am told by a source who was familiar with the meeting, then the Republicans said, okay, 12 months, no. Okay, six months, no. Democrats were firm on saying, three months and that's it and we'll tie it to the uh, relief for hurricane harvey and the president said okay deal and then at that point the republican leader the majority leader mitch mcconnell said okay well if we're going to do that let's at least extend the funding for the government so that we have it all in one package and i was told that the republican leaders were shell-shocked they didn't expect it certainly the democrats didn't expect it uh, they thought that they were just going to come out with a kind of agreeing to disagree situation, which they usually do. Uh, and that's not what happened at all. And yeah. there are a lot of Republicans on Capitol Hill who are felt feel pretty blindsided. But you also have a president who said, you know what, I am ready to do a deal. I'm sick of this fighting. And we've seen over the past couple of months that the president also doesn't have a lot of faith in the Republican leaders. And I think this was an example of that coming through. Yeah, Gloria, just listen to the speaker, Paul Ryan, before that meeting in the Oval Office. He made clear where he stands. Listen to this. The Democrats now say they'll only support a three-month increase in the debt ceiling. It seems like they're trying to extract something. I, I, I think that's a ridiculous idea. I hope that they don't mean that. Let's just think about this. We've got all this devastation in Texas. We've got another unprecedented hurricane hitting, about to hit Florida, and they want to play politics with the debt ceiling? That will strand the aid that we need to bring to these victims of these storms that have occurred or are about to occur. And that they also want to threaten default on our debt. I think that's a ridiculous and disgraceful. Ridiculous and disgraceful, but the Oops. president liked it. Right, he did. And uh, look, this is not about what the Republican Party wants or what the Republican leaders want. I mean, we know the president spent half of his summer dissing Mitch McConnell mm -hmm. on Twitter, for heaven's sakes. This is about what Donald Trump wanted. And what Donald Trump wanted was to show the American public that, okay, I can get my hurricane funding through. I'm not going to let it get tied up. I mean, he was clearly affected by what he saw in Texas mm -hmm. and what he sees coming, coming in Florida. And he decided that it didn't matter that Republicans feel that they're walking into a trap here because they're going to have to vote on raising the debt ceiling again in December. Exactly. And what it also means is that the Republicans understand now that the president doesn't care about them. So it will affect, I think, and, and Dana, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it will affect what they do on tax reform mm -hmm. and on everything else because they have clearly parted ways. Clearly, the Democrats uh, got what they wanted to be on. And by the way, welcome to CNN. You're now a formal yes. CNN contributor. Great to have you part of our team. Uh, but remember back in January of 2013, uh, then uh, private citizen Donald Trump tweeted against a short-term uh, debt ceiling extension. He, uh, I'll put it up on the screen. The worst negotiators in history, otherwise known as Republicans, have just offered to suspend debt ceiling for four months. Pathetic. Uh, was the president, was, and, and back in 2013, that's what he tweeted then, was the president just outsmarted this time by the Democrats? 
Well, we call it a tale of two Donalds, right, Wolf? I mean, it's almost a game now. There's a tweet for just about everything the president has said from his private life that can be contradicted now to what he's saying when he's in office. Uh, the president, uh, many Republicans could argue, does come across as very uh, desperate for a deal. We only had 12 legislative days in the month. He's got this huge Russia investigation headache as well. As you mentioned, he saw the devastation firsthand in Texas. He sees what's happening in the Caribbean as well. But, but mm -hmm. he say, listen, he could have at least tried to extend the debt limit for longer. To You have zero time now to get tax reform done. I completely agree with Dana and Gloria. And he also could have tied higher defense spending in as well, or at least attempted to. But I will say this is the president that never ceases to surprise. Mm -hmm. So uh, never say never until the ink is dry. And I was also struck by what Mitch McConnell said. He said this president speaks for himself. Remember who <laughs> else said that? Rex Tillerson. Rex Tillerson said that last week when he was asked about Charlottesville. So you do see this public divide within the party. And not only does he speak for himself vis-a-vis -vis congressional Republican leaders, I'm told that it happened within his own administration, that in this meeting, he cut off his own Treasury secretary, uh, who was making the argument for extending the debt limit for a longer period of time. Of course, it is the Treasury secretary in any administration <laughs> that has to deal with the debt limit and, and kind of gets a sense of, of when the, the U.S. is bumping up against the point where it has to be raised. And it was the president said, you know what, uh-uh. And then he, he moved on. But also, if you kind of take a step back, this, what, this is the Donald Trump that a lot of people coming into the inauguration thought that they might see. A Donald Trump who, is he a real Republican? Does he, he doesn't know the ways of Washington, so is he gonna then say, forget you fellow Republicans, I am gonna do a deal with Democrats? It hasn't happened, and today it happened. Uh, so it does show a, a different side of him, and it might, it might be because he has the past eight months of experience where he's gotten very frustrated with his fellow Republican leaders and the way Washington works normally with party politics. Uh, or, you know, it might be just the idea that he really did see this devastation and wants to move it forward or all the above. Well, you know, this is Donald Trump. I mean, it, as we were talking about before, um, he is not a politician uh, by training and he cares about himself and how he's perceived. And he wants to be perceived as somebody who is funding hurricane relief, period. And mm -hmm. I don't think he wanted anything to get in the way of that, including his own political party and including his own political future in terms of what he can get done uh, in the Congress. It, this is who he is. We haven't seen a lot of it because mm -hmm. there's been this push and pull in the White House for who can get to Donald Trump and mm -hmm. who, is he, who is he going to agree with today. Well, what does this mean for DACA, for example? Mm -hmm. um, we don't know, you know, the president's tweet this morning about DACA was, well, maybe we'll revisit it. What does that mean? As we've been uh, fond of saying, leaders say the president speaks for himself. Uh, members of his press team say the president's tweets speak for themselves and everybody is still left scratching their heads. And you know, yeah. and, and I want to get back to Bianca. He was so nice and friendly with the Democratic leaders calling Nancy and Chuck as if they were old pals. Uh, and that's clearly going to put a lot of Republicans in an awkward uh, position. Yeah, you didn't see him calling Chuck Schumer crying Chuck, right, or the <laughs> fake tears anymore. But if I were in the PR business, which I'm glad I'm not, I'm glad I'm a journalist here and a contributor, <laughs> especially with CNN, I'm so thrilled to be here. But if I were in the PR business, I would tell the Democrats that the last thing they should be doing is gloating right now because the president, of course, follows mm -hmm. the media very closely. And as we saw that head scratcher tweet this morning about DACA and him potentially revisiting it, if he sees that he's getting a lot of pushback from this and the Democrats view this as a huge win, <laughs> Mm -hmm. He could he, he could very well change his mind. As I said That's earlier, right. the ink is not dry. And you know, Ben true. Sass, a Republican senator from Nebraska, tweeted and called it the Schumer Pelosi Trump deal mm -hmm. and said it's bad. And you know, so it's already being called Schumer Pelosi Trump. Let's see how. Let's see if how the president he, revisits that, that deal it. as well. All right, guys, everybody, stand by. There's breaking news. We're following Hurricane Irma. A Category 5 monster. It's battering islands in the Caribbean and aiming for the United States right now. Tens of millions of people may be in the path of the storm. Evacuations are now underway in Florida. Top Republicans are reacting to President Trump's surprise deal with Democrats bucking his own party. It's a deal to avoid a government shutdown, and it would include a three-month extension on the debt ceiling. And this just in from Republican Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska, quote, the Pelosi-Schumer-Trump deal is bad. 
Just one line there. We're going to look at this story as we get more reaction rolling in. In the meantime, President Trump said he just had a, quote, very, very frank conversation with the president of China today over the intensifying nuclear threat from North Korea. The rogue nation this week boasted it had successfully tested a hydrogen bomb. Here's what President Trump said while speaking with reporters on Air Force One. Uh, we had a very good conversation with President Xi of China. It lasted for about 45 minutes. Uh, he's very much in favor of uh, the denuke of North Korea. Joining me now is someone who has had to directly handle the North Korea threat, former Defense Secretary William Cohen, who served under President Clinton. Secretary, thank you so much for joining me. So you. you heard what he said there, that President Xi is very much for the denuke of North Korea. There are many people who say you just have to live with the fact that this is where North Korea is. So is there an avenue for a, a denuclearization? Well, if China really joins the United States and we sit down with China and discuss with them an overall plan, in other words, what should a united Korea look like 15, 20 years from now, or maybe even a shorter time frame? We can't do that without having China as a full partner. So the first thing we have to do is to, once China gets through its plenum and, and resolve their own political problems, uh, not problems, but challenges at least, but um, to sit down with President Xi and his strategists and say, how do we solve this problem? Because a nuclearized uh, North Korea poses the potential for spreading that to South Korea, Japan, and others. None of us want that, so how do we deal with it? I think that's possible. What should, I mean, we hear it was a frank conversation that they had, but where do President Xi and President Trump need to be, what do they need to be talking about, besides obviously what you described as 15, 20, 25 year plan? They need to be talking about what the nature of our relationship is going to be with China. Right now it's unclear. What are we going to do vis-a-vis -vis China? China's a growing power, we're an established power. What does that mean in terms of the so-called Thucydides trap? Namely, you've got this imbalance taking place with the existing power being confronted with a rising power. History has not been very positive on that. Of the 16 studies that have been done, 12 of those studies resulted in looking at the past history. 12 of those uh, incidences um, involve war. So we're trying to avo uh, uh, avoid, avoid that if at all possible. Now, with respect to, uh, to North Korea, the North Koreans have been basically uh, showing contempt, not only for the United States, the United Nations, but also for China itself. Mm -hmm. China has been its principal benefactor. If the president of uh, China says, time for a change here, uh, I think the North Korean uh, president has to worry about uh, what's going to happen to his regime. You saw the Russian president's comments. Vladimir Putin met with the South Korean president today, and he said that the North Korea situation may be, quote, impossible to resolve. What did you think of that? Well, President Putin said a couple of interesting things. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said that uh, sanctions don't work. If sanctions don't work, why is he so interested in getting them removed from Russia? He's been desperate to have those sanctions removed from him. He said, well, North Korea is different. They'll eat grass. I don't think so. If the North Korean people understand they could have a Cobb salad or a Caesar salad and Texas beef as opposed to eating grass, they might have a very different reaction to the existing president and decide to overthrow the regime from within. That's the difference. And I think that's something that we should contemplate. We should send the signal on an information campaign to say you're not going to be so secure when your people find out what you've been doing to them compared to what's happening in South Korea. You support talking about regime change. Why? I've talked about it in the sense that if you're not going to change the course of your regime by stopping the building uh, of these nuclear weapons and threatening everyone, then we have to consider having a regime change. Hopefully that will come from within. Namely, if you have enough generals say, you know, we could be doing a lot better than we're doing now. Life could be much more secure and prosperous to us. I think they might consider uh, removing him. You see it as a important stick, as a motivating stick, right? I do. I think it's an incentive uh, that we should uh, look to, uh, to uh, in a stick that we should use, uh, I should say, to, uh, to uh, hit um, uh, President Kim with. Any dangers in that? Obviously, uh, he may feel that he has to respond uh, militarily. That's why we have a great defense and deterrent. I think he'd be in a very difficult position if his generals decide their lives are going to get much, much worse eating grass as opposed to eating well.
Well, it is a difficult problem, and Secretary Cohen, we really appreciate your insight on it. Thank you so much. We are just an hour away from the National Hurricane Center's next update on the path of Irma, and the lead with Jake Tapper starts right now. Thank you, Jake. Now we go to meteorologist Tom Sater, who's in the scene. Today, President Trump says he is not sending mixed signals and that he doesn't have second thoughts about ending DACA, that program that protects undocumented immigrants who grew up here in the U.S. No second thoughts. I hope they do. But last night, the president tweeted that he would revisit the issue if Congress cannot reach an agreement on DACA in the next six months. The Trump administration had until yesterday to make a decision on the program's future or else face a lawsuit by the attorneys general of nine states. And my next guest, Arkansas Attorney General Leslie Rutledge, is one of those who is pushing for a decision. Thank you so much. Uh, for uh, joining me on this. I'm wondering what you think uh, about what the president has said here where he may be revisiting this issue. Well, I, I commend the president for rescinding DACA in a very responsible uh, fashion, that we need certainty for these individuals, for these dreamers. We need certainty for America. We are a country of laws. I don't think the president is sending mixed signals in any form or fashion. He rescinded. The attorney general came out yesterday and rescinded DACA again in a very responsible uh, manner and giving Congress time to act. And it's time for Congress to act on immigration. And that's what the president is asking them to do. Um, uh, attorney General Rutledge, if Congress doesn't act, though, he's leaving open this possibility that he's going to revisit it, which seems to take some of the bite out of really pushing it into their lap to deal with. No. Well, actually, I, I read that tweet as the president encouraging Congress, listen, it's time, Congress, for you to do your job. And that's what I'm encouraged by as a state leader is that it's time for Congress to act on immigration for far too long. Uh, we have an immigration policy uh, in flux because of President Obama's action on DACA. That is why the state's attorneys general, uh, why we I sent that letter to uh, this administration was saying, listen, it's time to act. It's time to get a legal immigration policy in place. And that's what I believe the president is sending the message to Congress to let's get this job done. It's time to get the job done on time and under budget, as he likes to say. You've uh, stressed that you're not asking the government to remove any person covered by DACA right. or resin permits that are issued. But in guidance sent from the White House to the Hill, it says the Department of Homeland Security urges DACA recipients to use the time remaining on their work authorizations to prepare for and arrange their departure from the United States. So while that may not have been your intention, it appears that may be the result of this, no? Well, again, uh, the letter that we sent was not asking the government to remove any individual. However, uh, what the government has done now is said, yes, that those individuals who have uh, license in place, that we're not going to renew those however they can stay through those, uh, those license, through their approval time. They can, if you haven't, if it's expiring before March of next year, it's time to get those renewed. Turn that in by October 5th of this year. So this is a responsible plan. And I think that's what America needs is a but responsible this says, plan this says to give arrange, these dreamers the... Arrange for the departure. And even if you're saying that you're not talking about removing someone, uh, advocating to remove a protection, even if there are issues with how President Obama put this in place, advocating to remove the protection, of course, has the result of someone perhaps being removed from the U.S. Well, yes, and I believe that these, the dreamers that I have met with, these young individuals, that it's imperative that all of us are prepared for situations and prepared for uh, what might come. Here the government has said, here are the time frames, here are the renewal process, here are the application process. Take care of business, and but let's also put the pressure back on Congress to take care of business. So these individuals, I encourage them to be prepared, but not to be panicked, because again, we have a, a responsible plan in place from this administration to try to correct the wrong that was done by the previous administration. It was, again, the previous administration that did this, made these illegal, unauthorized actions, 
putting us in this uncertainty. And so now we're looking for certainty for all of these individuals that are impacted. Attorney General Rutledge, you say prepare but don't panic. If you were preparing to potentially be deported, would you be panicking? No, because these individuals, I know their status, and now they know the time frame from which they can uh, properly apply to, to work toward certain goals. And again, we, these, the individuals I have met with are so encouraging, bright, talented individuals. But again, we are a country of laws, and that's why their, their parents came to this country, is because of all the great things that the United States has to offer. But again, we are a country based on laws, and so we must adhere to those laws. And that's why we must have an administration that adheres to the laws, and the executive branch putting pressure on the legislative branch is all that is happening here. We're simply seeing the President of the United States tell Congress, Congress, it's time to act. Let's get some legislation passed and address immigration reform. And quite frankly, there are senators and congressmen already with bills in place or in the drafting process. Arkansas's but the number two Senator Republican, John has, Cornyn, said they're not, he said, here's what he said, there's no way it's going to be a standalone. And he basically said there's no way they're going, he said there's no way they're going to address this in uh, you know, soon. So there may be bills that are out there, but I mean, that's the buck kind of stops there, right? With the top Republicans in the Senate. Well, the buck stops with the American people and the American people need to tell the men and women that they have elected to the United States Congress, House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate that it's time to get some legislation passed. That as the attorney general of a state, as the executive office, we don't have the option to kick things down the road. And so we're now asking Congress to pass some reasonable immigration reform to address this issue and other issues. All right, well, Attorney General Leslie Rutledge of Arkansas will be watching as well. Certainly Congress hasn't inspired a whole lot of confidence in passing legislation recently, but uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Thank you, ma'am, we appreciate it. Thank you. And next, Hurricane Irma is already battering uh, the Caribbean. It's 185 mile per hour winds right now, sustained winds, uh, gusting up to 225 miles per hour. As people in Florida are scrambling to secure their homes and stock up on supplies or get out of the state altogether, we're gonna be live in Miami in just a moment. We are back now with some very intriguing breaking news coming out of the White House. Donald Trump has sided with Democrats when it comes to increasing the debt ceiling. He had a meeting with congressional leaders, and I have a picture that we just have to show you. This is of the top Democrat in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, there talking to the president. And coming out of this meeting, Schumer much more happy than the top Republican in the Senate, Mitch McConnell. You can definitely uh, be sure of that. But just take a look at their faces here. Very happy with this agreement that has the president bucking his own party and siding with Democrats. I want to bring my panel back in to talk about this. All right, Gloria, I mean, here you've, you've got this New York meeting of the minds going on there. Well, what were the faces of the Republicans that we didn't that we didn't see? Because I guarantee Probably you, Solon, uh, right? uh, Solon, because this was a deal, as Senator Ben Sass, a Republican, called it the Pelosi Schumer Trump deal. And as we know from our reporting that there were people pushing an 18 month uh, debt limit, others who are floating six months, but it was the Democrats who were floating three months. And the president just made a unilateral decision, as he can do, to say, OK, I'm going to take the deal that, uh, that Chuck Schumer offered. And I think the Republicans were beyond annoyed. What's the matter with this, David, though, if he's just even if he is just kicking the can down the road for three months, what's the matter with not having this fight right now and putting it off? We've seen Congress have smaller extensions on whether it's the debt ceiling or it's government funding. We've seen these things. Well, the argument against it is they're going to have to go through all of this again in December, right around the holidays, a nice holiday present for the GOP, which it's, it's sort of become an annual event with the Republicans. But White House aide just emailed me and said, look, there's too many important things on the agenda. Republicans will pass another debt ceiling when push, push comes to shove. They want tax reform. And also, a short-term deal allows funding for what you're covering today. A, another catastrophic 
hurricane that is going to pulverize this country. And we, we just saw the last week what the people of Texas and Louisiana are going through. The White House is arguing, get this off the table so it keeps the government open so we have funding for victims of Hurricane Irma. That's going to be their case. I think this is very much, uh, you know, perhaps the biggest example yet of on the job learning as president. Presidents, like every other job, learn on the job, and the president has power. The president does not have to outsource everything to the House or Senate. He can sort of make things happen. I think that's an example of this here. Uh, look, but I think I'm told the president was affected by what he saw um, um, uh, in the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Harvey. We obviously see what's happening in Florida. Some of his personal properties are involved in this. He knows what's going on. He does not want Washington sort of to be at each other's throats over this. Now, the question is, it probably will come in December, but he does have, um, you know, more leverage here. But I think this is a sign that he is, uh, you know, it's what some Republicans and conservatives worried about, that picture of Senator Schumer and, and wow. the uh, president. At the very beginning in January, this seems like a million years ago, <laughs> conservatives thought he's going to cut a deal with Schumer on infrastructure. That, of course, didn't happen. And this may be a one-off. This may be a one-off thing. Even some Democrats are suspicious about sort of all of this. But, but certainly very interesting some some other intrigue in this meeting gloria ivanka trump walks into the meeting uh is, takes part in the meeting and cnn has some reporting that republicans seem to be dismayed by her presence there what's going on here well and there is some pushback on that as as jeff is also reporting look i think republicans were dismayed by what was occurring in the meeting and so they may uh have acted like they were dismayed by Ivanka. We don't really know the whole the whole story yet about whether she she was in the meeting apparently to talk about uh, child care, tax credits, et cetera, et cetera. And she may have provided some relief <laughs> to Republicans who didn't like what was what was going on. I think there's also a question just among Republicans on how much juice Ivanka has. There's all this palace in intrigue constantly about how much influence she has over the president, right? She's the most powerful advisor in the White House. But when push comes to shove, she doesn't land on the same side as the president on a lot of these issues. And I think that's a constant a conversation, I think a Washington conversation, about is she just in the room as a symbol or does she really have some pull and influence over well, the president? We know that she is a very committed to this issue that she was in there to talk to leaders about. And this is the first time, we are in September, the first time that these four leaders have sat down at the White House with the president. That's sort of unusual. But I'm told as a fuller picture this comes together, as Gloria was saying earlier, uh, Republicans were annoyed in general. Uh, <laughs> I'm told that yeah. uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, was a bit more annoyed by uh, Ivanka Trump, perhaps but by the whole uh, picture. Speaker Ryan has said in a statement he was not annoyed by her at all. All right, very good point. All right, Jeff Zeleny, David Katniss, Gloria Borger, thank you to sure. all of you. Next, President Trump says that he's ending the Dreamer program, which protects undocumented young people brought to the U.S. by their parents who really know no other country other than America. Then he tweets that he might revisit this decision. Then today he insists he's not sending mixed messages. One of the state attorneys general who threatened to sue over that Obama era program is going to join me live. There's a clash developing over the different Russia investigations underway by two government groups. In this case, it's the House versus the FBI, as both look into any possible ties between the Trump campaign and Russia. California Congressman Devin Nunes is threatening to put Attorney General Jeff Sessions and FBI Director Christopher Wray behind bars for not complying with his order. Remember, Nunes supposedly had stepped aside directing the House-Russia investigation, but now he has threatened to hold Sessions and Wray in contempt for not handing over documents about that much talked about Russia dossier if they don't do it by December 14th. This is a dossier that you may recall was an explosive report by a former British spy, Christopher Steele. It contained unverified claims that Russian operatives had compromising personal information on then candidate Trump. Joining me now is a Democratic member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Mike Quigley. Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And I just want to know right off the top, what's your reaction to this letter? Yeah, it's extraordinarily unfortunate. This is the most important investigation uh, in our lifetime, uh, certainly of the White House, perhaps more important than Watergate. Uh, it is our standard practice to try to act on a bipartisan basis. Uh, it's never been more important than an investigation like this. And to seek a comp 
and to see a confrontational act like this is disappointing to say the least. So disappointing to say the least, we heard from Congressman Gowdy, who of course is a Republican member of the committee that you're on. He talked to the Washington Examiner about this uh, and why he wants these documents. He said, I want to know the extent to which it was relied upon, if at all, by any of our intelligence agencies or federal law enforcement agencies. And to the extent it was relied upon, how did they vet or either corroborate or contradict the information in it? Is that your perception of what uh, Congressman Nunes is seeking here? Is that the reason that you understand he's looking for this information? Well, that's the reason I hear from them. Uh, what, I, what I actually perceive when I hear that is their attempt to discredit Christopher Steele uh, rather than doing our due diligence to see if, in fact, the dossier is accurate or not. And if you want information, there's a standard practice here. You first seek uh, voluntary compliance, and you do so on a bipartisan basis. If that doesn't work, then with advi advising consent from the minority, you, you go forward with a subpoena. But we've committed to working with the Justice Department to coordinate with them on these three investigations. That coordination is especially important now. When you go to a confrontational mode first, it makes it far more difficult for further cooperation to exist. Is it fair, though, for Congress, or in this case Republicans, obviously, since they don't have Democratic support in this, to look into Christopher Steele and this dossier. Some of the things in it are, uh, as far as we can tell, unfounded. Many of them are controversial. Is it fair to look into that and to see if the FBI relied heavily on this or looked into this? What would the problem be with looking into these allegations? I think it's valuable for us to do our due diligence to see if the dossier is accurate. Uh, I've never been made aware of anything about it that is inaccurate, but I think you'll let the investigation take its course. Uh, to jump in now, again, on a confrontational uh, tact makes absolutely no sense. I think our commitment was to work with uh, the Mueller investigation and to provide assistance when we can, not accuse them of things as my Republican colleagues are at this point. Do you generally feel like Republicans are cooperating with special counsel? Look, I think we had a good uh, situation set up with uh, Mr. Schiff and Mr. Conaway working on our side uh, with the Justice Department, with Mr. Mueller. I thought we had an understanding that we were going to coordinate and I applaud their work. Uh, this is attacked in the opposite direction. It's not going to help any of the investigations. I want to ask you about uh, what appears to be a conflict that has come up. Paul Manafort, former chief of Donald Trump's campaign, one of them, uh, the second to last. He uh, has spoken, of course, to Senate investigators. There's a transcript of that discussion, but it appears his lawyers, or we know that his lawyers are saying no, that the FBI cannot access this, that special counsel Robert Mueller can't have access to this. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's another element in the same problem. The, the Senate investigation, the House investigation, and the Justice Department investigation have to be coordinated. If there is a big problem with this, uh, these efforts from the very beginning is that there was no understanding that the Senate and the House were going to work together. Frankly, I think there should just be one congressional investigation. You start to see the fissures that exist when you don't have that agreement, that cooperation, that coordination. You have conflicts like this. Again, we have to understand that the single purpose of this is far more important than the egos or the conflicts uh, that might exist between branches of government and the House and the Senate. The former National Security Advisor Susan Rice testified before your committee today. I, I know some of it, you certainly can't tell us what she said, but coming out of that, uh, what were your, I guess, impressions about what she said? Were new questions raised? Were your answers, or were your questions answered? Yeah, uh, I, I can't talk about what she talked about. Uh, I, can, I can say that she's an important witness, and uh, I thought she did an excellent job. Um, she's only one of a long series of witnesses that uh, we have to question. Uh, Did I you learn anything folks, new, though? Was there anything that surprised you or anything that shed light on something you weren't previously aware of? I think it's important to put it in this context. I think the majority is attempting to use the issues 
of masking and unmasking uh, as a, an attempt to deflect from the core purpose of this investigation. So uh, it's my sense that that's why the majority wanted her there, but I can't talk about much in specifics sure. as to what she testified to. Yeah, we do understand that. All right, Congressman Mike Quigley of the Intel Committee on the House side. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Floridians are keeping a very close eye on Irma. It's the Russia investigation back in the spotlight. Former National Security Advisor Susan Rice has been meeting this morning with the House Intelligence Committee. Seeing some video right there. Tomorrow, it will be Donald Trump Jr.'s turn in the hot seat. The president's son facing questions in the Russia investigation, his first time facing congressional investigators. CNN senior congressional reporter Manu Raju has all of the details on this. Manu, what are you picking up? I just spoke with uh, Joaquin Castro. I don't know if you had a chance to hear. He called the conversation with Susan Rice very informative. Uh, it, it seems that there are a lot of questions <laughs> there in that particular session about the issue of unmasking, but that is really not going to be the focus on the Senate side, not for right. the Senate Judiciary Committee or in the Senate Intelligence Committee. And the Senate Judiciary Committee, of course, now the home of this first time, uh, first venue of the first time that Donald Trump Jr. will actually answer questions about that June 2016 uh, Trump Tower meeting with Russian operatives Paul Manafort. Jared Kushner. Now, this is going to be a staff level meeting of the Judiciary Committee staff. Some members can sit in on the meeting, but uh, I am told that there's ex expectation that Donald Trump Jr. should appear publicly. And one top Democratic senator on that committee, Dianne Feinstein, told me that if he does not appear publicly, the committee is prepared to subpoena him. There's an interview scheduled. I'm not sure exactly where it is. It's a staff interview. Right. Will there be committee members going? Uh, I can't comment on that because I don't know. What but about yourself? The process Senator? that we've decided on, if a committee member wants to go and drop in, that's fine. But these are staff interviews, and the staff is not to be interrupted. No senators to take over the interview. Do you and, plan on going, Senator? Uh, no, I do not. We will have um, a uh, public hearing uh, with Mr. Trump at an appropriate time. And I followed up with her, asked her specifically about whether or not she'd be subpoenaed, he would be subpoenaed, and he, she said that, yes, that is very likely that he could be subpoenaed if he does not actually uh, appear for this public interview, which they I believe they had an agreement uh, to deal with. Now, uh, also, uh, another question for the Judiciary Committee and the Intelligence Committees to look at are these the issues about uh, efforts to, to build this Trump Tower Moscow project, something that we understand now that Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen, was pursuing even during the time of the campaign. Uh, this is something that Lindsey Graham, the Republican senator from South Carolina, also uh, said that he's interested in learning about it, whether or not this is any evidence of business dealings with Russia. He also expects Cohen also to come, Kate, to his committee as well. Any timing guidance yet on when, I, I mean, this would be a huge deal if Donald Trump Jr. appears publicly in a hearing. Any, any timing guidance on that? Uh, we've been asking members. Uh, we course. don't have an uh, indication that it's been right. scheduled yet. Uh, but that's something that some Democrats in particular want to happen this month. Chuck Grassley declined to comment, the chairman of the committee, when I asked him about that just moments ago, Kate. Stand by for that. Great to see you, Manu. Thank you. We are tracking, staying very close to Hurricane Irma, monstrous Category 5 storm as it moves close to the United States. The latest from the National Hurricane Center and a look at the worsening condition, conditions happening right now in Puerto Rico. That's coming up. Her name is Maida, and she was right now criticizing the action the president took yesterday in regards to 800,000 dreamers. And Senator Chuck Schumer, the Senate Minority Leader, said what he wants to see is a clean vote uh, on a bill to protect these 800,000 people. And if he doesn't get it, he says they will try to attach a version of that bill to everything else the Senate discusses going forward. Back now with our panel, Matt Lewis, first to you. You can sort of see now where Democrats are going to go with this. I think they want to wait and see what the Republicans come up with right now. Uh, but they have that luxury of sitting back and waiting and picking their spot. Yeah, I think, again, Don, I think Donald Trump has given uh, done no favor for House Republicans who have a lot on their plate as it is. And he's put them in an unenviable position. Uh, their, the Republican base is very worried about immigration, actually wants to 
curtail certainly illegal immigration, in some cases illegal immigration. And so they have the choice, the Republicans have the choice of being uh, uncompassionate or going against their base. And this is sort of, uh, this is the liberal version of, uh, on, in the abortion debate on the right, uh, if, you know, there are a lot of people who have different positions on abortion, but, but when Republicans talk about partial birth abortion or late-term abortion, they almost always win. For decades, Republicans scored a lot of points talking about uh, partial birth abortion. This is that version on the left, okay? Immigration's a, a hot button issue. There's a lot of controversy about it. But as long as Democrats can talk about dreamers, mm -hmm. they will always win. You can tell that Senator Schumer here is running up the score. It's really impossible to be against the dreamers. These are exactly, if you believe in assimilation, if you want uh, you know, people who would join the military uh, are gonna, gonna help America, uh, this is who you want in the country. It's hard to be against them. And yet, where does it end? I mean, you know, uh, what, what about somebody who, you know, what about a, a, a young immigrant brought here tomorrow through right. no fault of their own? At but, what point do we say, well, that person should be allowed to stay too? But Matt, you bring up what's so important here in its language and how it's described, mm -hmm. right? So it's described by some Republicans and, and Democrats, like you just heard Chuck Schumer, uh, the way that you describe dreamers, right, which is hard to argue with. And then it's described by other conservatives like Steve King completely differently as amnesty and where does it end, right? And, and when you look at this, uh, Scott, and you look at some of the polling, I mean, the most recent polling that we could find purely on, on DACA is October last year at CBS. And it, the way it's described is that nine out of 10 Americans support a path to citizenship for those who came to the U.S. illegally as children if certain requirements are met. Nine out of 10 Americans, if it's described that way, it's just not as simple as that. Well, I think the Dreamers have broad support in both parties, and that's ultimately, I'm going to choose to be the glass half full guy here. Uh, I think the Republicans in the Congress will ultimately pass something uh, that gives them the status that they deserve. What I think is really terrible, though, is this hyper-partisan rhetoric coming out of Pelosi and Schumer. Remember, Donald Trump didn't create this executive order mess. He inherited this executive order from Barack Obama, and his administration's lawyers, along with many, many other legal scholars, believe that if it had been challenged in court, it would have lost. Donald Trump, I think here, is trying to find a way to get this codified in U.S. law and not leave it up to a court or a future president uh, to uh, kick out this executive order. So ultimately, I hope the Dreamers get what they deserve, which is a law instead of some tenuous executive order that Donald Trump inherited uh, illegally from a previous administration. And it's, yeah, an executive order, <clears throat> it's an executive order that President Obama felt he had to write because Congress did not act. Congress has had multiple opportunities um, to, to, to show us that they are humane, that they care about the plight of these young people who have, uh, who have again, contributed to this economy, who are assets to our country, again, who are Americans in every single way except on paper. And they have failed to act. And so President Barack Obama acted as a stopgap measure, not to say that this is the only answer, but to put something in place to at least take care of the dreamers for now. Um, and then the issue would be revisited. Well, now we are revisiting the issue um, under a false deadline from President Trump, but we're revisiting Trump the issue. Trump had to revisit the issue because he's going to be sued. The state attorneys general are and going to sue nothing, the federal government. Think, the issue I think what's exists. really important here is there is, nothing, there is nothing to stop one, those attorney generals from suing today, because they could definitely, they could file suit tomorrow. I'm not an attorney, but I do communications for a litigation team, and I can tell you that, that you can file a suit at any time, 12 p.m., 12, 12 a.m., whenever you want to file the suit, the suit can go. And so there's nothing to say that the suit won't be filed. There's also nothing to say that Congress cannot concurrently act on DACA while DACA is still in place. There's, there's nothing. So this is a false notion that was put forth um, to, to make President Trump seem as though he was struggling with the dreamers and struggling with this issue. But to be frank, I, um, if you if something really why, wanted to why happen, you want, why, why do you want the dreamers to exist under an executive order and not a U.S. law? Wouldn't and you that's prefer not what I'm saying. What I'm saying instead of an executive order. And I agree, Scott. But what I'm saying is you Hang do on, not guys, need to throw guys, 800, I got to cut this off. As great as this discussion is, we got to go listen to the speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. It's really been impressive. Um, when this all started to unfold, they were reaching out to express the urgency of the situation. I mean, 52 inches of rain, this is something we've never seen before. And so they made it clear to us just how vast this problem was. And as soon as we finish here, the House will take action, as Kevin just said, on installment on this. We will not leave until this is done. 
Um, nothing can really capture just how big and wide this devastation is. Um, you, you hear a lot of numbers, uh, tens of thousands of people uh, in shelters, hundreds of thousands of homes damaged. Uh, nothing can really capture this. Um, when we look at, uh, when you turn on the TV in America today, you look at all the vitriol, you look at the bitterness, you look at, you know, rioting and all the rest of this. You begin to wonder whether or not our civil society is holding together.